大家好，欢迎你哋嚟睇 Hong Kong Ballet. Welcome to Hong Kong Ballet. I'm Subteam Weber, Artistic Director of Hong Kong Ballet, and it's a pleasure to talk with two amazing choreographers who happen to be great friends also,、um, and they're both based in Holland.、Um, uh, Annabel Lopez Ochoa, it's great to see you. How are you doing, Doll? Doing well. How are you? Doing great. And Stephen Shropshire, also based in Holland, American working in Holland.、Um, how's life going? Good, good. We're talking today、uh, about making new work, which is always a great thing to talk about.、Uh, but we're making new work in very special circumstances.、Um, both of you have made lots of work through the years,、um, and、uh, you know had the great fortune of actually being able to commission work from both of you.、Um, and、uh, and and we're working together now on、uh, a project, which we'll talk about in just a moment.、Um, I want to ask about. How、uh, how you create during the pandemic, and what kind of models、uh, exist, and particular how the working in these new ways have changed how you work and changed the work itself.、Um, Annabel, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about?、Uh, I know you've done a lot of work on film in the past, but it's somehow different now because you're really more、uh, you know it's 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 enforced.、Um, Uh, tell us about some of the creation on Zoom and how that has worked and what's been like.、Uh, well, I have three sort of creations via Zoom.、Uh, one is、uh, that I started approaching dancers back in April when I saw everybody, you know, posting on social media how they were doing, trying to do grand battements in their kitchen, and I thought、sure. that was not artistic at all, and I thought that was really sad. So I started making portraits of dancers around the world, making really short films. Then the other one is that you know, for example, Jacob Spillo, I had to do a choreograph for sixteen or eighteen dancers, I don't remember, and then I、uh, gave them tasks in their surroundings and then made a film out of that. And the third、uh, format is that I create, you know, a corona-proof work. For example, Tulsa Ballet, where I had six dancers that were masked in a studio. And whoever was not living together in real life should be staying away two meters away from each other. So those are the three、uh, sort of works that I made. And Annabel, in the case of、um, the the short dance films of individuals in their home, were you creating material on them? Were you dancing in your own home, showing them steps? Were you giving them tasks? Like, how did that work? Uh, yes, I show everything for how I can, but I'm also dependent of、uh, their environment. So the first rehearsal is me、uh, zooming into their house and trying to find a background that is interesting, and then you know、uh, also making a lot of B-rolls, so choreography that is chronology and choreography that is just images that they could、uh, potentially use. And then the day of the recording, I'm there on.、Uh, On Zoom, and they have, you know, a friend or mother or brother recording, and then I tell them where the camera should stand. So I do、right. the recording. Are these dancers who you've worked with before in other companies that you have a relationship with, and you contact them and say, "Hey, want to do something fun together?" Is that how that works? Yes, except with the flamenco dancer, she approached me because she wanted to work with me for one day, and I said, "Okay, let's use this form, this format." Ah, well,、wow, cool. Wow, that's great. And for Jacob's Pillow, were the dancers who you're working with were they in their own homes? Were they in studio, their home studio?、Uh, how how what was the environment like? Were they dancing outside? It was different. Some had a studio and some had their own homes. And、yeah. then、uh, at the end of the two weeks, I would then because I was and editing the film, I would then tell them, okay, can you go and you know do that phrase but wake up on top of the car of your parents? Who can do that? And then one guy was like, yeah, we have a car. <laughs> okay. Don't get arrested. Okay. So,、cool. one of the things I've been curious about is、um, is is the teaching of the actual steps. I mean, one of the things I do when I'm choreographing,、uh, you know, I get into the studio. My body doesn't move the way it did, you know, 20 years ago when I was first beginning to choreograph. So I, I mean, I, I kind of mark it, and、uh, you know, I I rely on the physicality of the of the dancers and their own、uh, sort of problem solving skills.、Uh, and over time, I give them a little less and less information. Uh, and kind of let them fill in the blanks. I get to you know trust the dancers that way.、Uh, what are you doing these days in that regard? Are you showing everything full out in your own like pull the camera back and yeah the steps I show out 
cute, the steps I show for love. When it's a duet, I sit down and I tell them, I, so I'm vocalizing much more, uh, you know, take the right arm, go underneath it, see what happens, you know. So I, I guide them, and, but they have to find out. So that's sure. different than when I'm in the studio and I love being partnered and, you know, swung around. So I can't do that. Sure. I've seen many a dancer throw you around the room and I see that joy in your face. Um, yeah. And with Tulsa Ballet Theater uh, and Dancers Mast, so you were, they were together in the studio, but socially distanced. There were and three parts of six dancers in three different studios. My first cast was the one that I pinned and the other parts were learning in another studio, uh, but I could just change, you know, uh, the camera as I wanted to. Uh, and ultimately this one part had, you know, they performed the piece, but there was a second cast for in case somebody would get infected or injured. So I had to at the end rehearse with the other ones also. And, uh, and was it a live performance or made a film? They had a small theater of 400 seats and they performed it 26 times. Wow. <laughs> and was the theater full or was it socially they're distant? Not, they're socially distant. They had 30 people in the theater. And oh my goodness. And they streamed um, uh, performances. Wow, that's, a, that's amazing. Um, S Stephen, uh, how about you? I know you've made some work, uh, uh, some pretty significantly sized work um, via Zoom. and. We're making you're making a work for Hong Kong Ballet that that will actually film next week um, and was originally scheduled to be a live performance, but you've been in Holland and we've been here in Hong Kong. Um, tell us about. I want to eventually talk about the work you're making for us, but I'd love to hear about your your experiences and particularly maybe chronologically how your work has gotten more how you've gotten more adept in this way of working. Yeah, I think it started um, at the beginning of the pandemic. I was scheduled to go to Jacob's Pillow also uh, for the contemporary program. And so my first uh, interaction with uh, creating on Zoom was through through that. With, um, and that was really ins quite inspiring. I mean, I, I, I thought, how am I going to work on Zoom? Uh, but to see these kids across the United States and, and internationally as well in their kitchens, in their bedrooms with no space and really committing to the work was uh, first humbling and, and, and incredibly inspiring. And I thought, okay, yeah, if they're willing, I need to also enter into this problem. Um, I think luckily I have been working um, with Method for years, so that facilitates working on Zoom um, for me. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, so somehow it didn't seem that impossible. And so I just had to try. And did you, how were you demonstrating? Like what, what, how did it, how did the steps actually get imparted? Um, well, with each project, it's been different. Um, uh, but normally I begin with uh, a, a baseline, sort of, uh, I construct a base phrase or baseline or a series of baselines, which then are um, through the method um, translated, transposed um, to create uh, multiple voices uh, from which I then construct the composition. So it's really rooted in an exchange, in a conversation between myself and the, the dancers who I'm working with. So that, sorry? Give us a quick little primer on the method. Uh, the method is, I, uh, it, it's um, uh, theme and variations in the most simple sense, right? So I begin with a, a, a base phrase, and that phrase is then uh, taught to the dancers, and that becomes a sort of framework for considering space, time, musicality. And uh, with that, the dancers can um, interact uh, translated into new material or translated into new uh, conceptual um, uh, relationships. Uh, in the case of, of the, the works, uh, uh, the works for São Paulo and the works for Hong Kong, um, that's all material-based, uh, so movement-based. Um, yeah. Um, I my, the first time we worked together, I hired you as a young dancer right out of Juilliard. Yes. So my first job. My first commission. I, I think it was like three or four years ago, was that? <laughs> yes, it was um, just yesterday. <laughs> I, was, 
my first directorship, I was the artistic director yeah. of the American Repertory Ballet in Princeton Ballet School in uh, for six years before moving to Washington. Um, and uh, based in Princeton in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and uh, we were 21 or 22 right out of, out of college. And one of the things that was so exciting, I mean, we worked together, we created a lot of material together. And I thought you as a dancer were really influential. In, and I mean, I was just developing my own choreographic voice at the time. And we made so many interesting things together. Uh, yes. I mean, flexing, flexing the hemlines, that amazing for, uh, for you and Molly Daly in one of the ballets, I don't remember, but uh, just a lot of work together. Carmina Burana, I think. Was, yeah, we did Carmina, yeah. that was that extraordinary as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, I thought, it, I always thought you was very much like your energy, your quickness, uh, there was a visceral nature to, to your, and, and precision mm -hmm. to everything you do, clarity and, and energy. How do you depart that through a camera? I mean, has that been a challenge? Wow, yeah, I mean, I think there, there uh, are certainly um, significant challenges in working on a camera, which I'm still sort of negotiating and, and trying to figure out in the last days of this, of this process. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that has been in my favor is uh, uh, the work is, um, the language of the work is ballet vocabulary. So that um, creates a sort of point of reference that is easier to negotiate. Um, so uh, less gets lost in translation, but in, in terms of style, in terms of approach to the technique, which is true, I think um, my approach is through a sort of um, speed or, or um, almost violence towards the technique, that that is harder to translate. So um, I'm sort of, I was thinking about it already this morning, like what that's one thing I will carry from this process is developing better tools to communicate that in words um, because I found even if you show sometimes on on video if I would show material or or Chris would show material still what is seen is not always what is intended and I think that that creates a sort of interesting tension in in the process for me um, I, I think we all know that video sometimes makes not such great things look a little bit better and some amazing things look a little less not as good. Yeah, I think yeah, that, yeah. We know that. Um, I'm gonna have, I have a question for Annabelle, but actually, Stephen, I do want to ask you about violence towards the technique and what that means. That's intriguing. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, it's important to... Uh, my, my work began with you, right? So you gave me my very first commission, as you mentioned, and I, I, uh, uh, this project is, is, has been very interesting for me because it's, in a way, a circle moment. It's like after 20 years, uh, 25 years, coming back to... Um, where my influences were and how our relationship um, uh, sort of created a groundwork for my uh, position in dance and my interests. But for the past 20 years, I've been outside of ballet. I haven't used ballet vocabulary. So my approach um, in engaging with the vocabulary again is not in, in a way, in a purest sense, um, but it is with, as a, as a person, living in the modern world, wrestling with um, all that that entails, and trying to find out how does this vocabulary, what does it mean to me, um, without trying to rewrite it or reinvent the wheel, right? So um, the world is rough, and you know, as we see what's going on, what has gone on, um, what is going on, and that manifests somehow in the application of the technique, the application towards the technique, um, my stylistic, what you might say, my stylistic approach towards it. Um, and by violence, I mean is one, one could uh, perhaps better say um, it's a sort of combination of reverence and irreverence. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's uh, to create a collision with the technique in terms of physicality, but also ideology. Um, Interesting. Um, Annabelle, um, could you, it'd be interesting to hear from you about how working remotely has changed the nature of the work. Are the ballets that you're creating different? Do we see similar physical themes happening or are you uh, kind of, re, uh, you know, are you composing for a camera 
camera view rather than a stage view. How, how, is, how is the pandemic and the need to work uh, virtually changing the actual works themselves? Um, I don't know if the work creating remotely on the corona proof uh, distance will be uh, more interesting and uh, to be viewed again later. Uh, but I did learn a lot about dance on camera and, and how that is a complete different language than concert dance. And from the beginning, I uh, uh, asked uh, someone, a cameraman to be my mentor, to teach me what, what, what is film and how is time and perspective? How do you play with that? Because in the beginning, my very first dance film was very chronological with a camera in three different uh, positions. And uh, he really opened me up. Uh, and I'm still, you know, creating films to learn about that language and uh, the, the millions of possibilities, more possibilities actually than uh, uh, concert dance. Uh, so maybe that will inform me as a dance maker once we can, you know, uh, stop the distancing and all that stuff. Because I find that that. Uh, distancing choreography, I don't find it very inspiring. I don't. I think it misses. Um, you know, it's it, it's nice to show that we're isolated. You know, on our phones and everything. But at some at some point, I want people to be able to, to create shapes together, and I don't want duets to be only you know one two people, but you know interacting with more people that can make a duet or an interaction happen. So um, yes, it's it's. I don't think I'm learning about choreography. I'm, I'm, I'm learning about dance film. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, when I think of you in the studio, you're like a, a, a spark plug. You're like this energy explosion and dancing full out and you know uh, being thrown all over uh, to get the visceral. And, and your, your physicality serves as not, not only you're showing steps, but you're also instructing style and energy and dynamic and whatnot. And I would think that the video being so far away smooths things out a bit. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to, I had to learn to vocalize my ideas, and uh, you know, I was at an age that anyway I had to start vocalizing more than showing more because I was more often injured than not. So it's been a good process to uh, get into that new uh, way of working. And you know, like like Stephen, that you give tasks about what people can do with their couch with the walls. I you know, on stage we don't have walls. Uh, so instead of being, you know, uh, frustrated that that wall is there, on the contrary, just embrace it, that it's there because sometimes you would wish that you had something to lean on when you were on stage. So that's, yeah, I'm trying to, to change the, the mind of the dancers being frustrated at home and, and, and make them being grateful that they have all these uh, objects and uh, sure. limitations. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a cool thing to do. It's, it's certainly inspiring for the artists, I'm sure. Stephen, um, you are like a prodigal son, I think, right now. <laughs> you started in ballet uh, and then left, as you just said, and we're really working in, in dance theater and contemporary, squarely in the contemporary world. And now, um, uh, corresponding with the pandemic period, also doing a multi-year project to re-engage with ballet and, um, uh, and investigate who you are as a ballet artist and what that piece of you is. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting that it happened right at this time when you've got to be remote. And, uh, like how, how's, how's the, like how would these pieces be different if you were present in the studio and you think working remotely, is there any kind of advantage to it, do you think, in the actual works themselves? Or is it all disadvantage, is it all challenge or overcoming? Uh, how is it influencing? That's a really good question. It's, I was discussing with a colleague at the uh, university recently um, about one of the um, most significant uh, challenges of the situation is it uh, it objectifies objectifies the material, right? So so uh, and that's also that's an opportunity in a way. I found that um, as opposed to entering into a studio, you are um, being informed subjectively by the dancer's mood, by your mood, 
what uh, oh if you ask this that might be a little difficult this is a little uh, uh, not so interesting all of those sort of um, unspoken influences that that are part of the process are eliminated in uh, working digitally or have been for me so I in the positive sense, I think that has allowed me to be incredibly objective about does it work or does it, does it not work? Is the composition, am I seeing what I'm looking for? Um, so I, res I can respond much quicker. Um, and in some way, I think, again, because the search that I'm on or, or where I'm busy right now is really committed to the vocabulary, um, to exploring my relationship to ballet vocabulary, um, it's allowed me, in a way, to also um, have less doubt. To be, to be, to that the, that the composition feels really mine in a way, rather than um, if I was in the studio. Uh, that, that might be um, a more complex experience. So I think that the notion of obje objectivity has been really, really important. But I think that also is something to consider for the future, right? Because it's, it, it also is changing dance. So dance is now um, what is uh, by nature a very ephemeral form, is now being materialized in a way that um, is going to shift what we're looking at. And that is also something that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, what role do I what role do I want in that, and what role does that does that mean for the art form in general? When this when film or working working dance on film, which has a great potential for accessibility, etc., but that also that also means something about a real shift, a real you know uh, fundamental shift in dance as as art. I mm. think the, the more the more commonplace that is. Um, Annabelle, uh, speaking of uh, kind of the future and we're, what, how this is influence, influencing us, what's going to happen after the pandemic? We're all better. It's 2022. The vaccines have worked. Um, will, uh, will these dances that you've made survive? How will your dances for a stage be different? And do you think, I mean, I know you've adapted your stage works to film. Are you going to play that in reverse? Uh, will some of the work you've made now find its way into a stage expression? Uh, well, I think after the pandemic, uh, very practically, there was so many, I had so many uh, um, projects uh, postponed and postponed again and postponed again. Uh, I think 2022, if we can go back to the theater, I don't, I don't have enough months for all this postponed project. So I, I think I will have to do, you know, all this full length that were lined up will need to be made before I can actually uh, process of what would be the new kind of works. So sure. I, I don't have the space yet to answer or even to fathom what would be the kind of work, um, you know, that I would put on stage. Because um, I'm still, yeah, thinking, trying to be informed of the works that I was preparing, how that would, how this pandemic would change that, but I'm hoping that it doesn't, you know, I'm hoping that we can do full length without the mask, even if those masks are, you know, uh, see-through. I'm mm -hmm. just crossing my fingers um, mm -hmm. that that would be possible, that we can have 50 dancers on stage, you know, plus, you know, all these rules that... So, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question yet, Satine. And what about transitioning from film to stage? Uh, are you actually going to adapt any of the works? Do you have any plans for that? Uh, well, yeah, there's the, this one work with English National Ballet School. I was supposed to go there. It became a film. In that film, one of the dancers was in Japan. So I asked him, could you put a kimono on? Could you ask your mother to go with you to a temple? And so he did my material in a temple. And mm -hmm. I had the dancers all over the world. Uh, I had them as sort of images on the temple walls. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it turned out to be a very different piece and uh, Viviana Durante asked me to reverse that process that we start with the movie, we're really in a temple and then it comes on stage. Mm. I'm, I'm very curious to that process, how that's gonna work out, especially that now one of the, it was a, a piece about Memorias El Dorado, about the mm. Colombian artifact 
So the women were dressed in gold. Um, and now there will be a, a Japanese man in a, in a kimono. So how will I uh, combine? I find it very exciting to combine these two ancient culture in one ballet coming out of the film. So that dancer has to bring that kimono from Japan when he comes back to, uh, to London. Uh, right. That's an experiment, so I have no idea what the uh, what the outcome will be. Hmm. Interesting, um, Stephen. What up, what about you? Uh, pandemic's over. You're back in the theater working. Is the work different? Do you think? Or, or and actually, a parallel question: um, Given that you're in the middle of this uh, sort of ballet project, I'll call it mm -hmm. yourself, uh, and and that project comes to an end. Um, is that also constitute a change in what's next for you? Like what, what, how will all this whole period, the, the kind of gestalt of uh, ballet again and pandemic, uh, what, what's going through the food processor right now and what'll come out the other end, do you think, the sausage maker? Uh, I think hopefully towards a, a more uh, total, um, expression of, of my interests, right? So I think absolutely, uh, I'm looking forward to um, integrating ballet into my my practice in, in a whole sense, and and so not only within a, a traditional ballet company, but also within my own context and my own project here in in Nederland. But I'm also uh, still busy, um, PhD candidate, also exploring these uh, concerns. Um, and I'll be working on that for years, trying to uh, organize some of this information and some of the, the lessons. You know, if, if I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, negotiating ballet and ballet vocabulary as a contemporary person, what more, you know, what better sort of uh, a project than a Zoom project than uh, doing that with technology between us. So, so that already starts a very interesting conversation, which I think will certainly influence um, my, my theater projects in the future. But I do, of course, long for getting back in the space uh, directly, to have direct contact, not only for, um, uh, for the uh, translation of the material body, but also to talk and to, to talk directly and, and, and exchange about work in general. Um, I, I miss that a lot. So, Stephen, you've been a, a very successful dancer, ballet dancer, and contemporary dancer. Mm -hmm. Then a very successful ballet, uh, rather dance, contemporary dance director in Holland mm -hmm. for for many years, and a freelancer in many different kinds of ways, uh, and now a PhD candidate. Tell us about your academic life. Um, I I started. Um, uh, questioning some of the things that I was seeing around around me within the field and questions I had about um, uh, what I was, uh, where, where I was positioned in the history of dance, uh, not only in Nederland, but also as an American choreographer working in Nederland and some of the, the, the tensions that arose from that. So I think that all sort of triggered this deeper search, um, uh, which now is, uh, manifesting in this, this uh, study um, or this inquiry into polarities and how dance is still defined by its polarities. We talk about contemporary and classical as, as those are two oppositions, you know, and I think that's, uh, um, you know, uh, it's problematic, of course. We talk technique, style, and all of the, the, the sort of blurring of, of those ideas uh, today has an influence on our ability to be creative, to to take um, to take the next step in dance, uh, specifically. So my interest is around investigating that within my own practice. What does that mean to me as a maker today? What is the categorization that I see happening, and that has happened to me um, throughout my career? You are this kind of maker. You are this kind of dancer. When I'm still figuring out what I am, right? And what I found very interesting is that um, through certain contexts, you can use certain colors from the toolbox, right? You can't use all the colors. Um, so uh, that's what's super exciting to me now is to be able to use colors I haven't used in years and, and how deeply rooted those, those expressions are in me and how um, it feels uh, almost 
like a channeling in a way, or a sort of coming home um, to use language that I haven't spoken in a really long time. And I think, uh, so all of this, that my academic work, but also my uh, studio work, all of my practice is about integrating all of those parts of my creative self. Um, well, welcome back to the world, O oh, ballet. Good thank luck. you. <laughs> um, Annabelle, you've been coaching a uh, fabulous ballet uh, that will be part of the uh, Turn It Out Festival uh, that we're working on right now. Uh, tell us about Sombrerissimo and tell us about how it's different coaching the dancers live, which you did about a year and a half ago or two years ago, and now returning to it via Zoom. And which is more fun to rehearse live or uh, virtually? It's always more fun to rehearse live. Uh, no. what, 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 what's easy is that I rehearse with them in real life. So I know them, I know their names. Uh, I know the jokes we had at the time. Um, you know, I can tell someone stretch your feet and his feet are always stretched, you know. So that, that's the fun part to work on Zoom with people that you know, it's easier. Um, but I'm especially exciting to where am I gonna put the camera? When, sure. what, I, I would love one of the cameramen to be one of the dancers because there's a lot of walking around and, and you know, I would love to use the height so that we see the, the formations better. Uh, so I'm most, they're gonna be good. I don't really have to rehearse them. Um, I just, you know, am gonna tell them where I think the camera will be. So sometimes it might be in the way and they have to see the cameraman as one of, instead of six men, a seven man. Hmm. That, that's interesting, that'll be fun. You also have a, a really great voice here in Hong Kong, uh, Luis Torres, our ballet master, who you've worked with a lot and uh, danced the work and has staged a lot of your work. Uh, uh, does that put you, give you a bit of a deeper level of trust uh, that the work is gonna be yeah, always. But, I mean, they, they already perform the work in front of an audience, so they they, they know it. it's just it's going to be strange because we're not going to run the piece. We're just going to do sections, so they're going to be all fit and uh, ready to perform the the very fast finale. And usually at the finale, they're actually already tired, so that's going to be a plus. Let's That'll see. Fun. It's out. No sweat, no sweat at all. Yeah. They'll have big artists drying it off between takes. Perfect. Uh, Stephen, um, oh, I'm excited about the world premiere that you've been creating, uh, and will be part of is will be part of this festival. Um, tell us about it. Um, it's the title is Handelwerk, and that is um, a, a sort of play on uh, the translation. The Dutch uh, Handel is uh, another term for trade or for uh, craft. Yeah, what is your trade? Um, so it's kind of a craft work. Uh, and it is, um, it, it's the third work I've made in this trajectory where these questions I'm having about uh, my relationship to ballet and ballet vocabulary. So it's, it's really um, going a bit deeper into uh, composition and uh, vocabulary and musicality, all things that I find uh, fascinating. And it's really just a dialogue with music. I mean, I was just wanted to dance. I just wanted to make a dance and all the complexity of what that means um, to really focus on composition and um, and uh, mu music and the, the luxury, the, the fantastic luxury that uh, to work with um, the musician on this project, uh, Nicholas in the studio and Rachel uh, to perform to perform live is just you know brilliant uh, to have that with us. In, in watching rehearsal, some things have jumped out at me. Um, uh, we're preparing, uh, I just recently I was working on plans to revive Cynthia Harvey's um, really beautiful and harmonious adaptation of The Sleeping Beauty, which she made for Hong Kong Ballet some years ago. Mm -hmm. And in viewing, I was watching it on video last week, and in viewing it, uh, it struck me, uh, just it reminded me what classical ballet is about and mm -hmm. what it does for the world. It mm -hmm. shows a mirror to the world and says, the world can be harmonious. Yeah. life's the world's okay yeah. uh, and yeah. uh, and 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 there's harmony and logic and symmetry to what we're doing and uh, when I saw that a run through of your piece uh, last week I thought it has so much commonality to that and I didn't expect that because knowing of your what your mm. last 20 years has been about <laughs> yeah. uh, and yeah. I thought maybe he forgot how to talk French in the studio <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was surprised. So I'm surprised. I was. I saw the 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 harmony, not just the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. so number one is the the relationship to 
the you know the 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 harmoniousness in our DNA. A yeah, yeah. B, how hard classical ballet is and how hard you put steps together. I mean, God, and then Fuente turned to the right, and then and then all is gone, and then from there, and then no yeah. no no preparation, no, another turn. Um, so sec, that's a second, and the third is how excruciatingly specific you are no that yeah. was not 92 degrees that was 90 degrees yeah yeah uh, uh where's all that anal retention when we work together <laughs> i think it, of course it's generated from you i remember you making me cry in the, in the i remember making you cry together me. that uh for uh Macruccio. but uh, I no i think i think it's absolutely true what you say and my um uh, there's this question about, you know, I'm, I'm working now on a, a paper, what this notion of classical ballet, right? How many versions, how many classicals are there? Like, what do we mean when we're talking about classical ballet? But I think uh, the classical to which you refer also, um, if we look around the world, those are not values that we carry as society anymore. It's not about order. It's not about harmony. We're sort of celebrating other values in society at the moment. And so um, I think to readdress that is sort of very interesting at, at, at this time in history. And, um, and, as, has, and ballet has always sort of carried this, you know, um, uh, this faith, this belief, this uh, um, Apollo's Angels, uh, Jennifer Holman's book, um, writes very beautifully about, about that about the, the role of ballet and, um, and that, that sort of shift in the sort of cultural conversation. So this idea of harmony, of clarity, of specificity um, is, is very important in the work to me. Um, and that has to do with also making a, a bit of sense of, of, of order of, of where I am in the world and what do I find. You know, I started as a musician, right? I started as a singer. So this notion of of, 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 of harmony is sort of ingrained in me from a very, very young age. Um, and that's not to say that that is a limitation, that is a point of reference um, that comes from my academic training as in, in ballet. Um, so, and as I said, because it was a color that I was wary to use for many years, um, it's, it's sort of like okay, let's just go in. Let's dive head into this to this um, to this problem and see what that is. Yeah. Because people, I mean, there's really like a, a French word for every step in the ballet. Yet it's yeah. fresh and modern and uh, a, a clearly a, an expression of the 21st century. Thank that's, you. That's, that's Thank fine. you. That's very because I think the, the 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 interesting thing to me is about unlocking it from this mythology, from this um, these sort of. Of rules of engagement, which perhaps those should be questioned, but the vocabulary doesn't need to be questioned. It's, you cannot say that the vocabulary is no longer useful, just like you can't say that a language is no, you can't write in an English language anymore. That, that's sure. only. Um, and I think the same, the same for, for ballet. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the premiere, and actually, as this airs, the, you know, the premiere will have happened. Uh, so looking forward True, to it. True, yes. Um, hey, Annabelle, I want you to come out of the closet about something. Will you um, share with the audiences of the project that we're working on together for next year? If uh, next year happens. <laughs> next year happens. If we get over through the, the, the fifth wave or the sixth wave. We will. Uh, After the 17th wave, what are you going to do for Hong Kong Ballet? Uh, well, after the 17th wave in lockdown, uh, we will be working on uh, a new full-length ballet about the life of Coco Chanel. Yes, I'm so yes. excited. It's going to be so much fun. Really looking forward to it. Uh, it it's going to be great. Uh, June 5th of 2022. Yes. That's the whole great. world will be coming to Hong Kong to, for this amazing premiere. Um, and also, we have other plans, Stephen, you and I as well, and Hong Kong Ballet. Um, this uh, premiere of Handel work is the first of a pair of works, uh, sister works, that are part of your three-year residency here at Hong Kong Ballet. Um, uh, can you talk about that residency a little bit and maybe just some things that we've talked about for, for the next work? Yes, I'm very, very happy and um, thankful to have this uh, this residency with Hong Kong and, and um, uh, to have the time to uh, 
reflect on some of these questions and hopefully also in conversation and, and in the studio that I'm having. And um, so this is the this is sort of the initial, uh, the, the starting point. Uh, and we've been talking about some uh, more installation work um, for a coming season uh, that would be part of a, a program um, looking at um, climate and, and the change in, in climate and, and the relationship to sort of decay and, and uh, change, which I find super interesting and also in relation to um, the role of ballet in a contemporary sense. And we um, have, uh, Stephen, currently remember, we, we actually envision the work as a site-specific work to uh, activate a, a really important new new air, a place in Hong Kong. Is that yeah, you can kind better. Work, <laughs> you that kind of work very much with where? Sorry, could you repeat that question? <laughs> have you done work outside the theater very much before? Is that something new to you? Yes, or? yes, I have. I have done, uh, and I'm actually doing, uh, uh, I, I call it an installation, but I, I'm taking a sort of broad stance to what that means, installation. I'm also doing a, a installation work in Sao Paulo, uh, uh, site-specific. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's a sort of very interesting uh, way to create new dialogues with uh, material and, and, and all of these questions of style, technique, uh, ballet. Great. Well, um, Stephen and Annabella, it's been such a pleasure to talk with both of you, and it's fabulous to have both of you in the Turn It Out Festival, but also uh, that you'll both be here after the 17th wave in 2022 <laughs> with uh, yet more new work. Uh, sending you lots of love from Hong Kong. Thanks to everyone out there for joining us. See you at the ballet live sometime soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> See ya.